So today we're just going to do an overview of the uh, ASL solicitation. The number is uh, 21-599 and the, the URL is down below. So next slide, please. So what you'll find new um, updates from the previous solicitation is the deadline is now Jan January 18th, 2022. There are no limits to the number of proposals that an organization can serve as lead on. Um, some, for some projects, allow, allowable material can now be submitted electronically. Please check the solicitation to see if your project would um, be under that category. Also, you'll notice with the new solicitation, the narrative, the project narrative is now 15 pages down from 18. And also as a reminder, all proposals must articulate a clear rationale describing why a project is primarily informal and how it adds value to the informal STEM learning community. Next slide. Okay, and as a reminder that uh, all proposals must be submitted through research.gov or grants.gov. Um, any proposal submitted in response to this solicitation should adhere to the uh, proposal and award policy and procedure guide PAPPG and that number is NSF 22-1. Um, so again, those are the two, two documents that you really need to pay attention to are the solicitation and the uh, PAPPG. So next slide, please. So the, the core elements of the uh, ASL program advancing. So we're really looking for innovative projects that advance the field through building knowledge via innovative approaches and research. Informal, learning that is lifelong, life-wide and life deep and learning that occurs outside formal schooling systems. ASL is also looking at STEM and not just focused on science, but all of NSF funded STEM, including social and behavioral sciences. And finally, learning. Learning outcomes typically include interest, engagement, motivation, behavior, identity, persistence, understanding, awareness, knowledge, use of, use of STEM content and practices, and 21st century skills. Next slide, please. And so ASL also has program priorities, and those are maximizing strategic impact. And here we're looking at um, projects that address areas of continued development and advance, advances the informal STEM learning field. So the overall impact of strategic impact must go beyond the local level. Um, enhancing knowledge and bu knowledge building projects must describe and make a strong case for how a project advances knowledge base of the informal STEM learning field through research and or evaluation. All, another priority is promoting innovation. And here projects really should be on the frontier of STEM learning and informal environments that will advance the state of the art. Advancing collaboration, projects should lever leverage resources from, of partners, um, strengthen, strengthening infrastructure and building capacity. So these projects uh, would share research and other improvements, provide focus, professional development and resources. And finally, like all NSF funded projects, uh, broadening participation, um, supporting projects to engage professionals and the public from populations typically underrepresented in STEM fields is a priority. And again, not every project needs to address every priority. It's typically better to, to address one or two priorities well than try to address all the single, all these uh, in, in one project. Oh, next slide, please. And finally, these are the uh, learning sectors. When we think about uh, informal STEM learning, these are some of the sectors that we're uh, interested in. Um, I'll just leave this slide up. And uh, Bob, when you're ready, you can go ahead and take over. Okay, well, I might just comment. You can see the diversity of different uh, 
types of informal learning experiences the program supports. And as Brad indicated, uh, these are just some examples. And if you have another informal learning environment or approach, you know, that's certainly eligible as well. And often people combine elements from, you know, from different segments of the informal learning, uh, different sectors here that are involved. And so, you know, we often, you know, a museum will do a media focused project, maybe combined with an exhibit or, in, you know, many, many kinds of combinations like that. And those are certainly welcome. Um, so we can move to the next slide now, please. Um, Okay, so there's uh, separate project types. There are pilot and feasibility studies, which are early stage projects to address issues when a project isn't quite ready to develop, you know, a large proposal. Uh, research and service to practice are projects that emphasize understanding the learning that's taking place within a particular learning environment. Uh, so that's the focus of that project. Whereas innovations in the development, the, the focus is more on, on designing you know, doing the research and development to design new approaches to engage people in learning. So the emphasis there is on a new exhibit technique, a new way of using interactive media, you know, just in other words, a, a new approach to engaging people. And the emphasis here is on developing whatever the resource is and doing research to understand if this approach is effective and understanding the kinds of learning that that, that system or experience supports. Um, Broad, implement, broad implementation projects are to take a, an existing resource, you know, an, a program, an exhibition, you know, or a combination of elements that have already been developed and have been, that have really solid, in, solid research or evaluation information that indicates that this approach worked with the audience for which it was designed originally. Uh, so broad implementation projects try to get the project out, you know, more broadly. I guess that's why it's broad implementation, uh, and so that may that may involve uh, adapting a, an existing program to a new environment, whether it's a new community, such as you know, uh, developing a program that was originally just a kind of a general program to work with work in Spanish, addressing the language and cultural issues there or a broader geographic area, you know, to deal with, let's say, rural environments versus an urban environment in which it had been designed. And so obviously that adaptation process would be very interesting. What issues are you addressing in your project, you know, to, to make the adaptation effective? And, and there would be some interesting research questions you could ask in that regard. Um, Literature reviews, syntheses, and meta analyses are different ways of doing a very in-depth look at a at a base of research that's been done within you know a, a focused research area, uh, and so you would identify a body of literature, and in in especially in syntheses and meta analyses, there are very specific methodologies that guide how the how the research projects or literature references are selected and vetted, you know, with regard to their relevance, as well as the robustness of their research designs with respect to what was being researched. So all of these would, so any, either of these options would uh, select, you know, a theme that would be of broad interest to the informal learning field for which there exists enough research that you can take a, take a broad look across the research that's existing and try to arrive at some higher level findings, you know, based on the approach that you've used. Uh, in one similar way, conferences do the same thing in most cases. In other words, address some issue that's of broad interest to the field, whether it's, you know, type of informal learning experience, a, you know, a range of research issues related to one of the sectors or one or more of the sectors and so forth. And so conferences typically, you know, have a, you know, have an overarching purpose and then have a methodology with regard to how the conference is structured so that conference can come up with something beyond having a bunch of people get together and have those interesting conversations we all really enjoy. And, and th that can certainly be part of it, but you also want to have a strategy that will result in something that is that is of more lasting value and relevance to the field. So you may come up with you know, a white paper, a research agenda, a learning community, something that will that will build on the key themes that were, you know, that were the result of the conference and how to carry those forward. Uh, all right, uh, next slide, please. 
So the ASL program has solicitation specific criteria if you select broader participation as a primary goal as Brad discussed earlier. And so what broadening participation typically means is that you're focusing on a particular community or communities that are underserved in science and, and an important objective of your project is to engage that, that uh, target group in more effectively in informal STEM learning. Um, and so it's not simply identifying a population like, you know, maybe you identify a, a network of community organizations that, that, that have participants from the community you'd like to target or a school that has, again, a, a you know, significant portion of people from that community. It's really, how do you ground your project in that community? And you take an approach that builds on the strengths and the knowledge of that community. In other words, the assets of that community, as well as the interest, what's relevant for that community. So you, you may have some, some area that you'd like to introduce to that community. So uh, that's one thing is to make sure that the way the, the particular theme of your project, as well as the way that you're doing it, will truly engage the community. So typically it is, you know, it is very effective to engage that community early on in planning the project and to have specific planning processes, front end evaluation, whatever, perhaps some of the leadership can be from that community. That's, that's often a, you know, can be very valuable a part of such projects. So the, the point here is that in the solicitation, you'll find several specific questions that you're asked to address in your proposal that, that ask you about how you're grounding your project in the community. And, and if you have broadening participation as, you know, as one of your key objectives, then you should, you really need to address these questions and come up with strategies so that the project is grounded in that community, its strengths, its interests, its needs, and, and, uh, and you have a strategy for, so that that community can participate, so they can come, you know, get to the site if the project is a site-based program or in some ways, or in some effective way, have access to the project. All right, thank you. Uh, next slide, please. So evaluation and nasal projects, you know, the overall, the overall purposes are first to support iterative improvement. In other words, the evaluation isn't to make sure that the, that the project was effective in, a, you know, in delivering what it said it was going to deliver and perhaps educationally effective. Iterative improvement is getting information as the project is developed, you know, to improve it, you know, so that the final version, you know, the final ex exhibition design, the final uh, after school activities or whatever it is, you know, that it's, that it's as, you know, is about as effective as it can be because you've identified perhaps some uh, areas that aren't working so well and you have tried to design so that those areas would be more effective. So your project should have, should have addressed that particular area as well as uh, accountability uh, again, you know, so that one part of an evaluation process is to look at, did you deliver what you said you were gonna deliver? And what was the quality? Did you achieve what you had hoped to achieve through the project? Uh, in some cases, an advisory committee can perform this role. In other cases, you would want an external evaluator who would gather data directly from participants. There's no one size fits all evaluation plan. It's what work, what is most relevant and effective for what you're trying to do in your project. Uh, and it's often useful to talk to a program officer about your approach to research and evaluation in your project uh, to get their feedback on, you know, perhaps giving you some recommendations on how to, how to position evaluation and research in your project. Next slide, please. Um, so you can get feedback from a program officer by submitting a one or two page summary of your concept to the email address listed on the slide there. And uh, Julie fields most of these inquiries and then she'll redirect an inquiry to a program officer who may have the greatest expertise in the area you're hoping to address. So we, we very much encourage you to submit one or two pages so that we can have a discussion with you and give you our feedback as well as address any questions you have.